Good afternoon. My name is Bill Lewis. We're here with Occupy Boston TV at the Brookline Access Public Access TV station. I have with me Nicole and Ben who are in outreach and in streets and we were going to talk a little bit about what all is going on. To begin with, um, what is your background? How do you guys come to uh, Dewey Square in the first place and what made you care so much about this movement? Um, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I work right near Dewey Square. Um, I work at a public uh, insurance company. I'm not going to say which one. <laughs> um, but, um, but I work uh, there and I didn't know anything about this. I, obviously I knew what was going on in New York. It was making big news. And then one day on a Friday I left work and there were all these people uh, marching and protesting in the streets. And I was amazed because I saw that, you know, these people who were my people were finally waking up. I was kind of waiting for, you know, like something like 10 years, ever since uh, the first, well, the second Bush got elected for something like this movement to happen. Um, and when it finally did, I, you know, I knew that I had to jump on board. I didn't know they were going to be there, but then Monday rolled around and they were still at Dewey. So I, uh, I went on down and I uh, started to introduce myself to people and it just kind of snowballed and I've been involved ever since. That is fantastic. And what, what, is, what are the biggest issues that, that made you go like, oh my God, I have to be involved? Well, basically, um, I think that, well, our society, I think, is um, in a place right now where it's difficult for people to get ahead. Um, it's really hard for people to move forward with their lives. People that are my age, um, you know, they go to school and they take out however much in loans, $100,000, $150,000 in loans, and then when they come out, they're in the hole 150 grand. And that didn't used to be the way it is. And now even with those, with those degrees, you can't get the kind of jobs that you used to be able to get. Um, you know, in my generation, there's a huge number of people that have low paying jobs they they are you know they're coming on 30 years and they're still living with their parents just because they can't afford to live on their own and that's not the way america used to be that's not the way america should be you know we deserve to live in a better country mm -hmm. and, and nicole how did you come well it's funny because no one bad was peeking out his window watching us i was one of the people in the streets um i actually joined occupy at our very first ga um, that Tuesday, before we occupied. Um, I've there, been, where we met at the bandstand? That when first? we met at the bandstand, the first hour was really scary, then we actually got the ball rolling. Um, I've been an activist for a while. Uh, I'm 21 years old. Um, I organized my first protest this past May. <laughs> uh, yes, um, it was um, an anti-rape protest that has now spread globally. So, that, so um, I've had like a little bit of experience in this, not much, but I basically start out with anti-rape activism, reproductive rights. So very much from a feminist standpoint. And as any feminists tell you, you cannot just be a social feminist. You cannot just be concerned with social issues. Without the economic issues being understood, I mean, those have direct ties to what mm -hmm. it's like to be a woman in this world. So that's kind of where I came in from. So I self-educated over the past, past three years. Um, I became ill when I was 18. Um, went through periods of homelessness. I struggled a lot financially. I didn't have backing for my parents. So I kind of learned firsthand about like how, not only to get ahead, just how hard it is to get started in mm -hmm. this world. I mean, if you do not have a backing of wealth, that middle class background, you can just say goodbye to any upward mobility at this point. Mm -hmm. I understand. So I kind of self-educated that way. I just started reading. Um, the history I learned in school is not the history I find that really matters. There's been a huge history of uh, oppression, social activism in the past like you know, 200 years. And I kept seeing like, why aren't we doing anything now? Things are worse than they've ever been. And we had the capability to do so much more. We have all this stuff that people in the 60s and the early 1900s and the 80s, you know, they didn't have, but nothing's happening. Why is that? So I kind of, on my end, started making things happen through the avenues I knew how to do with women's rights. Mm -hmm. And then I saw uh, Occupy Wall Street start happen. I'm like, finally, we're hitting people where it hurts. We're going after Wall Street. This is where we need to be. And uh, then I saw on Facebook. It was really like, that Tuesday I saw a Facebook page for Occupy Boston. I'm like, oh, God damn, someone beat me to it. But <laughs> wow. I, um, I went, and I haven't left. 
So, that's so you, from the very first day. The very first day, yep. Wow. And you've been doing a great deal in the different working groups during this period. Uh, yes, I stay pretty active. Uh, Occupy has efficiently occupied my life. <laughs> I am in Streets and Outreach. I actually started out in Outreach. I was one of the founding members. Uh, I started outreach and then streets. I'm in direct action. Uh, I am in several anti oppression groups um, White Allies Against Racism, Women's Caucus, um, anti oppression as the overlapping group. I was also participating in facilitation for a while, but time constraints got to the point where I couldn't do that. And then I dabble here and there in other groups. That is amazing. I mean, obviously I'm in facilitation, yep. and yet I find no time to do everything I want to. I manage to get to work with some groups a little bit, but you, you manage to do everything, it seems. Well, I'm unemployed, so it helps. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, jobs do get in the way of they occupation, do. don't they? Yeah, so I was in school full-time this fall, so I did have that going on. That's a lot going on. So, uh, you all are now working in streets, which is a relatively new working group. Mm -hmm. um, and what kinds of things have you been doing? Uh, well, streets is funny. It kind of formed very organically. Uh, I remember back in November, I was talking to another streets member. Streets had informed me about this idea we wanted to do, which was a mobile march. Basically, having people start from different locations and doing very independent actions and then meeting up kind of a way to like mass mobilize Occupy and definitely just do direct outreach in the community mm -hmm. through, out, through actions. And then we got teamed up with Ben from Outreach who was focusing on canvassing and then mm -hmm. you can probably take it from here. Well, I mean, basically we got a couple other people involved and um, reached out to some of the other working groups um, and s asked them to do, you know, these other actions that they're mentioning. Um, and we had actions, um, Mostly educational um, actions, not so much some of the more mm, subversive actions that, uh, say, Occupy Wall Street is famous for. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm also a fan of that. Uh, <laughs> but um, but we, we got we got people to do um, foreclose on a bank, and they're doing stuff against the um, the uh, immigration. Uh, policies um, that was uh, the Occupemos El Barrio, which is a group uh, out of East Boston. They focus mostly on um, immigrant and Latino issues. Um, we had um, a, a lot of different groups doing a lot of different actions. Occupy the Farm did something. Um, they're focused on uh, food justice, um, which there's you know there's a great need for that as well. Um, so we had all these actions across the city, and then they all converged um, on Copley Square. And we had maybe, I don't know how many people, I'm, I'm not good at estimating, but it had to be more than 500 people over at Copley Square. Um, okay, I, I will do the estimate. I would say that we had between three and 4,000 people there. I, I, I've done a number of these. So I, was, uh, I marched with Occupamos El Barrio mm. and uh, felt very connected to my brothers and sisters sure. who speak pretty languages that are flu, uh, malefluous, I guess is the word I wanted. It's just prettier than English. <laughs> but um, you managed to coordinate a huge number of different actions or groups that were doing actions and get, get, get us all together in mm -hmm. Copley Square. How did you manage that? Uh, That's a good question. <laughs> basically, I think we just we put out the call to have a bunch of actions on this day and we said you know please people tell us what where you're going and uh, so that we don't have multiple actions at the same time and then we had a specific time where we were all to meet at Copper Square and people not, not everybody came at the same time um, but people came around the same time so we had one group of people coming in at 1.30 then another group at 2 o'clock and Gradually, the crowd the crowd kind of grew. Um, when, so. Oh, sorry. No, well, one no, thing please. I saw that was very helpful is that we actually started a good amount ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So we did have a good like two, three weeks of planning. And I know, like from my end, from my participation in the working groups, I was definitely prodding them into actions. Like, this is happening. Let's do something. And then people actually did. And I think it's the good thing about this type of um, mode of operating is that it trusts groups of people to be able to do actions on their own. Which which um, stays to decentralized and um, 
anti-authoritarian anti nature of Occupy, saying, you know, we all have the power to do actions, to do things that will create change. Here is a forum where you can do that. It doesn't have to be an action I agree with, but you can do that. And that was a really, really cool thing about, about the, um, the rally. So, so uh, uh, there was so much autonomous action surrounding it. And of course, the whole concept of autonomous action is that you get a good idea, you, you talk to other people, you get them involved, and that's all you need to do. It's a little more complicated than that, no. though. Um, so autonomous action is the idea that you know, we do all have this power to do these actions. We don't need someone to tell us to do them. But within that autonomous action is that you have to be very, very aware of risk. So like, I am in a, a few affinity groups, actually, where if we do actions, or we're in a situation where we need to change a plan of actions, you know, I look at them and say, we, we, may do, we may need to have to do this. Are we comfortable doing this? Are we comfortable with the risks of doing this? Mm -hmm. Will this bring risk to the other people who are here in the anonymous group? That's all a part of doing autonomous action, is understanding those risks and making those decisions. But tr trusting each individual to make those decisions that are best for them. So once again, taking away the idea that we need to be told how to act. Well, I think mm -hmm. that's really important too, you know, that we, we don't have leadership structure, you know, like we're, we're all leaders. And it's when you have these affinity groups, when you have these working groups uh, that are working together, communication becomes so incredibly vital. And not, not one person saying, we're doing this, but everyone kind of creating a decision together, building consensus, um, figuring out exactly what they want to do and how they want to do it, and make sure that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. So there's room for autonomous action, for people to do individual things, but the people that they're working with should know what those things are that they're going to be doing. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we're going on a march that's kind of been built as um, family friendly, we don't want to bring in more confrontational actions in that march because the people there haven't consented to that risk. So just balancing, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. And it's very important. I do like days like the Unity Rally where you can have a whole range of actions with a whole range of risk and allows room for people with diff very different ideas of what actions could be to come out and do them. Like some people are much more for those more confrontational um, actions, and those are great. They can be very useful. Some people are much more creative. I can't do creative things to save my life, so <laughs> I'd probably just be standing aside you know, in admiration. But it allows room for those type of things. Mm -hmm. And different actions have different ways of reaching out to the general public, which is kind of what we try to do in streets. Right. Try to find like really creative, innovative ways to reach out to people through actions. And I know that you've uh, had a number of other uh, actions and things that streets have been doing. Uh, obviously, uh, several of us are going up to New Hampshire in a couple of hours, and I believe you had something to do with that. I believe we did. Yeah, we did. Um, well, <laughs> one of our members is uh, very handy, um, and they built an elephant, uh, an eight foot tall elephant that is embedded with live stream technology. Um, and people can um, post notes, their wishes and dreams, uh, or rather, not their wishes and dreams, but what their hopes are that the candidates would talk about. And this elephant is staying in New Hampshire. It's going to be at all the events. Um, uh, you know, like where it's going to be in a, a march that's happening. Um, and then it's going to be with the candidates when they go to St. Anselm's College. So they'll have an opportunity, although I kind of doubt they'll look at it, uh, but they would be able to, if they want to, look and see what the people, the, the actual people of the United States want them to be talking about and not, and not just talk about you know, what they think uh, or what their, their campaign managers have told them uh, is important for them to talk about. because. I think that the current political system is out of touch with the average American. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think out of touch is putting it a little nicely. <laughs> but the elephant is supposed to symbolize that elephant in the room, the big thing we aren't talking about. Uh, not, not the political party elephant. This is the right. elephant in the room I think it also elephant. ties to that, but it's also the okay. elephant in the room. Because you see like these uh, Republican candidates talking about you know, gay marriage, abortion, these issues, that, they are very important. But most people are like, where are the jobs? How am I going to feed my family? You mm -hmm. know, what, what am I going to do next year when unemployment runs out? And these are things the candidates have not come up with any real answers to, except that it's Obama's fault, which is really not useful for anyone. So I think just like points to how broken our political system is. Mm -hmm. It's so divisive. It's so distanced from the real needs of the people. 
which is why you know we have Occupy, because mm -hmm. we are the people. We're making, we're acting as a megaphone almost. So hopefully our voices can somewhat reach those people up in Washington. And how are we doing? Are are our voices reaching uh, at least the rest of the American public? I think that we're reaching people definitely. I mean, um, we're we've been all over the news um, for you know uh, quite a few months now. Um, ever since ever since the start of this, it's been all over the news. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that we're reaching out to people, and part of what we're doing in streets is we're trying to reach out to people on an individual level because I feel like what the mainstream media puts out there about us mm -hmm. is not necessarily accurate. Um, they say that we don't have a message. That's absolutely untrue. We do have a message, and the message is that um, our economic system is not working for the majority of Americans. That's what the, that's what the message is. Um, you know, and we're working on finding solutions to make this country a fair, more um, democratic place for all of us. We don't have all the solutions, but they don't either. Um, That's so. the funny part. And I, I find it very funny because you see it on the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. They don't have a message. They don't have an answer. It's like, well, of course we don't. We just started three months ago. We have a governmental system that's you know, very, very old, and they're not coming up with anything either. In fact, they can't make any decisions because they're too, you know, there's too much partisan politics. So like, at least we're trying to at least find some agreement. Uh, cer certainly true. For the, the example that, that comes to my mind is that uh, we haven't even be a been able to agree on a jobs bill for the regular uh, uh, citizen, whereas, boy, the bank, t the bailout for the banks, that passed like that. Mm -hmm. It's funny because we do get very, very caught up on um, Washington. You know, mm -hmm. these, fe these national federal politics, which are very, very broken. But I think what we're trying to do streets also is like bring it back home. Bring it like, how does these policies up here affect us down here? Right. Um, mm -hmm. So like streets, we're starting on, um, we're getting started on a campaign against the MBTA um, fare hikes. Yes, you, we were talking about the uh, T-Riders. Oh, tell us more. Well, well um, so we're, we're, we are having officially start the campaign, we would like to get involved with an organization called the T-Riders Union, and what they do is they advocate for, um, for fair uh, services by the T. Um, right now there's a uh, proposal to um, cut, well, to, the, so the T is in uh, financial constraints right now, that's putting it nicely. They have a hundred and sixty-one million dollar deficit at this point in time. And and thirty cents out of every dollar that they spend goes towards paying off debt. So a lot of their annual um, a lot of their annual budget um, is not even being used for services. So there's a couple of proposals that they are um, putting forward to change services. And by the way, this can be found on their website mbata.com. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's right there, all the information about all the proposals. Um, so one of the proposals raises the price. Um, and By 40%, so that'd be about 70 cents. Well, it depends on what demographic. Yeah. So, um, so for example, with that proposal, um, it would raise mostly for seniors, uh, senior, senior citizens, students, uh, and uh, people that use uh, the ride, um, which is um, people that are, you know, uh, have d difficult mobility. Um, so that would be one of the proposals and there would be less cuts to service. The other proposal would have lots of cuts to service. It would be cutting, um, but the fares would not go up as much. So they'd be cutting 100 bus lines. Um, like, no, no more. You cannot ride those buses anymore. Um, also in both plans, they'd be cutting service to the E-Line. Um, on the weekends, as well as commuter rail on the weekends and after 10 o'clock. Um, and they will also, what was the other thing? They're also cutting the Mattapan high speed rail right. on the weekends. And also they'll be cutting the ferry service. Now this is coming also in some of the highest tea ridership months we've seen ever. Like these have been rec record breaking numbers that people are using the tea. And this whole plan is problematic because it disproportionately hits the communities that needed the most it's going to hit, you know, people of color more. It's going to hit poor communities more. People in outlying communities. And people in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And basically, what Plan One says, like, we're going to make it so you can't afford it anymore. Plan Two says, 
well, maybe you can afford, but it's just not going to be there. So either way, the people lose. Either way, the people lose. So uh, uh, when I was at MIT, I was suitably impressed that uh, as a well-paid professional, MIT covered half of my uh, cost for the tea, you know, the subsidized tea ridership. And this is something that very, various versions of this have gone around for a long time where people who are doing fairly well get subsidies of all sorts and the people who really need them are, are the ones for whom the fares rise and, and the service cuts happen. So this is how you can see it connect directly to what's happening in Washington. So there's this deficit, mm -hmm. just like Washington has a deficit. How do we fix this deficit? The politicians, the people with power say, well, we just got to make these cuts so they'll be okay, without looking at where are these cuts going to do to our communities, mm -hmm. how it's going to affect the common people. And with these cuts, I rely solely on buses. So if they cut the bus services near my home, which they may do, um, I won't be able to get to school. I won't be able to get to work. I mean, my, my prospects for a job goes down to a much smaller area. Mm -hmm. um, public transportation is a great equalizer in some ways. Not, not everyone can afford a car. But public transit is there for the public. Yeah. It opens up a whole new possibility for opportunities. And essentially what this is going to do, especially with the closing of the Mad Pan High Speed Rail, it's going to totally mm. shut off communities from the rest of Boston. And of course, the, uh, what we want is we want our, our population to be able to go to places to get good jobs and do well in their lives. And uh, by, by raising fees and cutting services, people aren't able to do what, what they should be able to do. And yet uh, the, the typical uh, contra to that is we're still talking about cutting taxes for the very wealthy and we want it. And, well, uh, and sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> so, and you know, I mean, like, I mean, exactly what she was saying, like, this is not uncommon uh, to have such a huge uh, debt. Like, the government has a debt, MBTA has a debt, cities have debt. Like, this is across the board, individuals have debt. You know, like, every, it's, it's all over America um, that we have this reliance on debt. How many people do you know that owe money on a house that they bought or on a car? I mean, it's everybody. And um, it's just not the right way to, to run things. I mean, every, basically everybody is in debt. If you have no debt and you have 10 cents in your pocket, then you're richer than a large population of America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically what we're, we're hoping to do with work on this issue is mm. do a lot of solidarity work right. with the communities. Um, a lot of us in Occupy come from relatively privileged backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, we're a middle class movement right now. We don't have to stay that way, but at this point that's where we're at. And that's not a bad thing, but we can use our relative privilege to stand in solidarity with the communities that are heading this up. So there are a few community organizations that are starting to um, organize around this issue. One is um, ACE, which stands for Alternative uh, Community. Uh, We're really bad at acronyms. Uh, 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 <laughs> acronyms. Acronyms are difficult. True, I know. True, I have. That's T Riders Union, and they're a division of ACE, which has to do with uh, uh, communities and environmental issues. So they're very concerned with uh, environmental justice, which also ties in with. Uh, with public transit. Um, so you have less cars on the road and now they have electric buses, but they're gonna be they're gonna be cutting all the all these services. And this also of course cuts to services is also of course gonna mean um, cuts in labor costs. So you're gonna have less people that uh, have jobs. And if there's anything that we need right now, I think that it's more jobs in America. There's so so many people that are unemployed. So that's gonna be Yes, uh, this is a huge problem, and of course, uh, well, being unemployed just multiplies upon itself. Right. An interesting thing that's happening, though, is also um, youth groups in Boston, community youth groups are coming up in protest of these new uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. So I personally would love to stand in solidarity with these youth who are going to be very, hit very, very hard, who may not have ways to get to school, so don't mind being unemployed, can't get a job without getting an education. So mm -hmm. really, these things are really harming generations to come. Which is really scary. Uh, as we've noted several times uh, in, in other groups that uh, we we're actually cutting our education budgets yep. and funding tax breaks. Yep. And now there's for-profit universities that you can go to online 
which are, you know, which have higher costs and don't, their degrees actually don't mean a whole lot. Um, they're not accredited universities, but yet you can pay a lot of, a lot of money for them. So there's, there's, there's a lot of issues. But going back to, you know, um, the T riders issue, this is a, something that could really, it, I think it is going to affect a, a lot of people and raising awareness is really important. There is uh, a number of community meetings that the MBTA is putting on and I think it's really important for anyone that is interested and in cares about this issue, which should be a lot of people, I, I'm going to be there, um, to go to those meetings and talk to the, the MBTA leadership and, and talk to them about why they don't like either of these proposals. They're both bunk proposals. And uh, where will people find out about where these meetings are, et cetera? They're posted on the MBTA website. Um, they also should be posted on the um, Boston.gov website. I don't know if they're up yet, but they should be there. Also, you know, on your communities, pay home pages, they shall be up and running. There also be announcements in two stations. I've well, seen. that is excellent. And we're heading off to uh, the uh, New Hampshire primary fairly soon to do a little bit of protesting up there. We're going to be visiting your elephant. <laughs> and is there anything that you want us to take to your elephant and tell him all? Or her? Is it a? Do we know? We can use gender-neutral pronouns. Oh, which one? Um, Z. Z. Is there anything that the elephant so that we can tell tell Z from you while we're up visiting her? Z. <laughs> Zim. 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 Um, try to get in the room. The elephant, the big elephant in the room, and we will try to get in there and make the best impact we can. Well, Nicole, Ben, it's been a wonderful pleasure talking with you. Thanks, Bill. And Thank you. We will be in a working group somewhere soon. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Nicole? Thank you. Thank you. Ben, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Bill. Pleasure.